Chapter 12 Out Under the Dome Within the well of darkness rang the metallic reverberations from the battering on the four doors all around. The fluid nothingness was a place of fear. Its nerve-shattering, mind-confusing bedlam might have come from the fantastic anvils of some giant, malevolent blacksmith. The hawk's curt voice cut through imperatively. Keep your heads. We'll have light in a second. Light of a sort. He threw the switch by the side of the chamber of brains. Seconds passed, and where was darkness grew a faint glow. The switch had operated. The current, probably from the device's own batteries, was there. Quickly and steadily, the liquid within the case took on its self-originating glow until the midnight laboratory was faintly washed with the delicate rosy light. The wires emerged in their complexity as before, and then the brains, all gruesome and naked in their cradles of unnatural life. Around the internally lit case were the three besieged earthlings, half in blackness, the light from the front making ghastly shadows on their faces. Acolytes at some sorcerer's right, they looked, with the long inky patches that left them to dissolve formlessly against the far walls of the room. Grotesque in the operating garments he wore, his bald head shining in the eerie light, Elliot Lethgow approached the microphone Dr. Koo had used to communicate with his pathetic subjects. He looked down at the brains and the wires which threaded the pans they lay in, at the narrow gray tubes that pulsed with blood, or whatever might be the fluid used in its stead. All mechanical was the apparatus, all of metal and other cunningly fashioned man-made materials. All but the brains. To the old master scientist, there came a vision of five human figures, rising specter-like from the case they were entombed in. Straight, proud young figures, two of them, two others old like himself, and the fifth a gnarled hunchback. Very different were they, each from each other but each face had its mark of genius, and each face, to Elliot Lethgow, was warm and smiling, for these five men were friends. So he saw them in vision. Another switch has to be thrown to talk with them, Cars, he said. The hawk indicated one inquiringly. Lethgow nodded. Yes, that was it. The switch went over. He steadied himself and said into the speaking grill, I am Elliot Lithgow, master scientist Elliot Lithgow. Once you knew me, Professors Geinst, Estap, and Norman, Dr. Swanson, and master scientist Cram. Do you remember me? Do you remember how once we worked together? How long ago on our earth we were friends? Do you remember your old colleague, Lithgow? He stopped, deeply shaken. In seconds, his mind sped back through the years to those five men as he had last seen them, and to two women he had met, calm-faced as their husband scientists. God forbid those women should ever learn of this. Curse watched his old comrade closely, fearful of the strain this was on him. Then came a cold, thin, mechanical voice. Yes, Master Scientist Elliot Lithgow, I remember you well. The scientist strove to keep level his voice as he continued. Two friends and I are trapped here. Dr. Ku Sui desires my brain. He wishes to add it to... He stammered, halted, then burst out. If it would help you in any way, I'd give it gladly. But it couldn't, I know. It would only aid his power-mad schemes. So my friends and I must escape. And we can see now no way. You can hear that noise? It's very loud. 
Men are outside each door battering at them, and soon they must break through. How can we escape? Do you know of a way out of your knowledge of conditions here? Will you tell me, old colleagues? He waited. That is a lot of questions to ask. It'd be sad if they answered them all in order. It'd be like, no, yes, thanks, no, yes, thanks, no, yo, yes, no, yes. And it'd be like, wait, wait, what, which one was that? <laughs> Fifty feet away from this scene, and missing almost all of it, was Friday. From his post at the panel, he kept throwing fearful looks at the nearest door, which was shuddering and clanging and threatening any moment to be wrenched off its hinges. A good thing, he was thinking, that the doors were of stout metal. When one did go, he would get five or six of the soulless devils before they brought him down. Kars waited tensely for the response, if one there was to be. His ears were throbbing in unison with the regular crash of rams on metal, but his eyes never left the convoluted mounds of intelligent matter so fantastically featured by the internal radiance of the life-giving liquid. Impossible, it seemed, that thoughts were stirring inside those gruesome things. Please hurry, he said in a low voice, and Lethgal repeated desperately, how can we escape? Please be quick. Then the miracle of mechanism and matter functioned and again gave forth the cold voice of the living dead. It is my disposition to help you, Elliot Lethgow. On a shelf under one of the tables in this room, you will find a portable heat ray. Melt a hole in the ceiling and go out through the roof. Then what can we do? In lockers behind the table, there are spacesuits hanging ready for emergencies. Don them and leave through one of the asteroid's port locks. Ask if the ports are sealed, Kars interjected instantly. Lethgow asked the question. Yes, replied the unhuman voice. But twice four to the right will open any of them. The master scientist wiped his brow. Though trembling under the strain of conversing with this machine on which his life depended, he did not overlook a single point. But the asteroid's gravitational pull would hold us close to it, he said. Is there a way of breaking free from it? You'll find the spacesuits are equipped with small generators and gravity plates, which I helped Ku Sui develop. The switch and main control are in the left-hand glove. Thank you, oh, thank you, you give us a chance, exclaimed old Lethgow. He turned and looked for the hawk, and found him already in the lockers and pulling out three spacesuits. The clumsy, heavy cone of a portable heat ray lay on the table ready to hand. They had little time to waste. The torrid temperature of a new smell of burned metal around the door they had just entered told them, as well as words, that the large projector in the corridor was at last being used to bore a way in. With surprising strength in one so slender, Kars lifted the ray and pointed it at an angle toward the middle of the ceiling. He pressed the control button, and a blinding stream of violet radiance splashed against the metal above. It hissed and sputtered where it touched. Molten drops fell sizzling and splattering to the floor. Then suddenly there was a flood of ruddy illumination, and the hawk dropped the heat ray, stepped forward, and looked up. Up through a neatly melted round hole, up at the great glass-like dome which arched over the whole settlement, up past it, into the vast face of Jupiter, hanging out there oppressively near. Friday, champing for action, left his post by the panel and dragged a long, low cabinet to position under the hole. On top of it, he placed the operating table, and after he had tripped the table's small wheels, another table on top of that. You first, Eclipse, his master rapped out as he finished. I'll pass the suits to you, then swing Lethgow up. The Negro answered by acting. 
Swiftly, he climbed the rude pile and reached for the edge of the hole. It was still searingly hot, and he gasped with hurt as his palms and fingers clenched over it, but he did not let go. Levering himself rapidly up, he got a leg through and then his body. A second later, he peered back in and lowered his hands down. No one up here yet, he reported. All right for the suits. Kars passed the three bulky suits to him and also two extra ray guns he had found in the locker. Now, Elliot, up. With the hawk's help, Lethgal clambered onto the cabinet. He was just mounting the operating table when, from behind, came a thin metallic voice. Master Lethgal, Elliot Lethgal, please, a favor. Lethgal turned and stared, then understood. It was the coordinated brains. They had forgotten to return the switches, and now the cold voice was speaking of its own accord, and somehow, though it might have been imagination entirely, there seemed to be a tinge of loneliness to the words that sounded from its speaker. Instantly, Lethgal got down and hurried over to the grill. But Kars and he were heavily obligated to the brains, and any request in reason had to be fulfilled. Yes, what could I possibly do? The lower hinge of one side of the barricaded door gave, burned out, and the door wrenched inward at a resumption of the battering. The other hinge still held, but it was bending with each mighty blow. Outwardly calm, Hawk Kars watched the weakening door, a gun in each hand. This, said the toneless voice, destroy me, leave no slightest trace. I live in hell and have no way to move. There are old memories, things that once were dear. Earth, my homes, my lives there. Elliot Lethgow, destroy me. But promise on your honor as a master scientist never to let a single word regarding my fate reach those on Earth who knew me, loved me. Leithgow looked at the hawk. The adventurer nodded. I'll use the heat ray, he said with pity. He ran and picked it up, but he had taken only one step in return when the second hinge of the yielding door wrenched free. An ear-piercing screech rent the bedlam, and the door fell, half-twisting to lie in the doorway. As if by a signal, the crashing at the other doors stopped. In an extraordinary silence, a mob of gray-smocked bodies pressed forward. Orange streaks laced the dim laboratory. The hawk shouted, Up, Elliot, for God's sake, up! As with deadly effect, he poured his two ray guns at the advancing men. For a second, shaken by the terrible barrage, they fell back, leaving several sprawled bodies on the floor but they came right back again. Lethgow got safely to the top of the pile and was snatched out to temporary safety. Frantically, Friday called down to his master. He seemed on the point of jumping down into the fight himself, but Hawk Kars had been party to a promise. He was behind the structure of furniture under the hole he had made in the ceiling. With one gun, he spat death at the coolies, while the other he emptied at the case of brains. Two stabbing streams of orange angled from him, one telling with awful effect on the men only two score feet away, and the other absolutely useless. All over the still glowing case it spat its hits, but the glass-like substance resisted it completely and remained unscathed. Kars swore harshly, he hurled one empty gun at the case, turned with a last salvo of shots at the coolies, and then was up on the pile and leaping for Friday's hands. They caught and gripped his, swung him once, twice, and hauled him swiftly out. But as the hawk disappeared, he shouted down at the case, I'll be back!